Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on your time zone where you might be. Uh, good to see you people in the chat jumping ahead. There's my pal Jay Lippman. Uh, good to see you, Jay. My pal Marlon from White White Noise Studio. He's here to make sure I keep it real. He's gonna he's gonna double check and make sure that I don't uh, misrepresent any information here. Um, one of the things I've been working on on my channel lately is really trying to up my um, video editing content game. It's something we all we all work on, I think, incessantly, right? Um, can you get, do I sound okay? Does everything seem all right? If it is, give me a thumbs up in the chat. If you can look, if you can hear me, if it sounds okay, then I know I've done something right. That's a good thing. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys about, uh, improving your video content I've talked about recently, but the audio I've only touched on just a little bit. I've done a live stream on how I do my audio using a uh, Reaper digital audio workstation. Uh, but I've only ever done one just showing people how to install the software and get it going. And, uh, and just, just so you can have a better sense of how to control your audio for all of the video content that you put up on the channel. You always sound good. Thank you, Everyday Tutor. I appreciate that. Jay, thumbs up. Uh, awesome. Yeah, so, so audio is one of those things I think is really underrated. Uh, if you guys happen to catch my latest video talking about how to make your content look more cinematic, half of that was really trying to create audio uh, an audio soundscape, and uh, that's a word we'll get into deeper, that helps that video content, um, you know, represent the look. Because half of what you're seeing is actually what you're hearing. And that can be as simple as making sure that your microphone tones are dialed in uh, in a way that they sound decent. Uh, and it can be all the way to the how you add music, how you add sound effects. Because um, one of the things I think some people do is they think, oh, if, if I have something happen in a video, I will add a sound effect for that thing happening. And the reality is if, if any of you guys have ever watched like the behind the scenes of how they make things like, um, you know, any of the Marvel movies or, or any like the Mandalorian, any of the Star Wars stuff, there's like intense layering that goes on to create the kind of soundscape. And soundscape is different than just audio. Soundscape refers to the ability to use sounds, music, um, integration of anything you might be hearing to create atmosphere, right? To create a feeling or an emotion. And that is super powerful, especially if you're trying to up your video editing game and make sure that your content has the most impact, then the ability to grab the audio and create a soundscape, as opposed to just, you know, turning on a microphone or putting in a couple of sound effects or dropping a music bed in behind it, becomes um, an infinitely more important and uh, intricate web that you start weaving. Uh, I don't know if in my last video, I, I showed the layers just to have a drop of water fall, hit some a, a puddle of water and make a splash. And I think I ended up using 16 different layers of different sound effects and, and, and music together to really create a much larger, um, you know, soundscape than, than, than existed. The footage was, had no sound whatsoever. So I had to create it all from scratch. So there wasn't even a reference point where the water was dripping from the faucet and where it hit the, the point of impact. And then the water exploded. I had to sit there and take notes and, and I, I hope that video was helpful. Um, I'll link it, uh, I'll link it down below afterwards. If anyone's watching in the replay so they can check out what I'm, what I'm talking about. But it was really uh, trying to show creators that, you know, when you when you think video, I think we all have that initial urge to say, oh, it's video. So I see it with my eyes. If I want my video to be better, my video content to be better, I improve what I'm seeing. But improving what people are hearing is just as important. Uh, it's just as important. Uh, let's see. I'm going to just quickly some some of the, the uh, comments in the chat. John says, I've been learning to enhance audio by using Adobe Audition. Uh, the difference is mind boggling. Yeah, a, Adobe has like a built in um, what we call DAW. If you ever hear me say DAW, D A W, I'm referring to digital audio workstation. And a digital audio workstation is much like if you're used to using video editing software where you bring video edit, uh, video content in and you put it into your timeline and you start adding tracks where you might put more video, some B-roll, or another track might have some text overlays, and you start creating layers that represent the overall video once it's um, exported. A digital audio workstation does the same thing, but you're doing it all with audio tracks, with either WAV files, sometimes MP3 files, different types of um, audio files, I prefer WAV, and you're just taking those and you're using them to create layers the same way you would in a video, where you would create 
the main footage and maybe B-roll and maybe text overlays uh, and maybe put in transitions, things like that. And you have audio layers in your in your digital in your uh, your um, video editing software, but some video editing softwares have very advanced digital um, audio workstations built into them. Adobe is one. Um, DaVinci Resolve has a has a, a fairly decent digital audio workstation built in. But I tend to use things that are simpler video editing softwares like Filmora or I use Movavi, and they have basic controls like you can control the EQ. You can pan things. They have some, Filmora has some keyframing and so does Movavi. You can keyframe the audio and fade things in and you can create layers, but neither one of those, Movavi has some some built-in effects, audio effects, Filmora has none. They have like pitch shift, but they don't have any kind of delays or anything like that. Um, but neither one of them have the ability to add robust video editing um, uh, audio tracks within the software, like things like compression, equal, you know, advanced equalization, um, advanced noise reduction, um, things like spectrum analysis, where you can actually look at the sounds in a, in a, in a visual graph to understand if the, you know, what the contour of that sound is, is it very bass heavy? Is it very mid heavy? Is it very treble heavy? And that's some of the stuff we're going to talk to about here today. Um, yeah. And if you have some questions, ask them in the, in the chat, I, I will get to them. Um, try not to spam. Uh, you know, I, I will do my best to, to answer questions, asking them 900 times. It's probably not going to be the way to get it done. Uh, Zo, uh, Zo or Zoe, uh, what did I do? I mainly use, I don't use just one. I don't, I don't. Sometimes I use Filmora. Sometimes I use Movavi. Sometimes I've been using DaVinci a bit lately. Um, I use, I use Filmora Pro sometimes. It depends on what the job is. This is a big thing I try to talk to people about. Find this, most of the video editing software out there have some sort of fee, free trial, whether that's, if, whether it has a watermark on export or whether um, some of them, DaVinci has a, one that has reduced features, but it's completely free with no watermark. Movavi, I think gives you like a week free where everything works. What I recommend is, is trying different video editing softwares and see which one feels right for you because th there is no one right tool for the job. You know, it depends on what it is you're trying to do, what kind of workflow you're creating, the kind of video edits you're making. Um, there's a big difference between making film um, and um, doing commercial work or doing something like uh, just putting up content on YouTube that's like tutorial stuff like I do. So you're going to find the tool that works best for you and your workflow um, will kind of speak to you. You'll use it and go, I love it. This works exactly. It's easy. I understand it. Um, I don't have a, I don't have a favorite. Um, a lot of people ask that, which editor is your favorite? I would say that in general, I tend to use, um, not, I use Filmora 10 right now um, because I've used Filmora the longest. It's been my go-to daily driver where I just kind of grab it and go. But that's been, lately I've been using Movavi more because the, some of the other features in Movavi work a little bit better. The green screen is a little bit better, um, but Filmora has a better, um, has a better color correction. So it just depends on what I'm doing. If I know I'm doing like really advanced color correction, I'll go to Filmora. If I'm doing something where I want really fast and easy keyframing for a lot of different layers like text and things, I'll use Movavi. Movavi has keyframing on pretty much all of the elements you drop in. So it just depends. Like I said, whatever they're, um, whatever you need, whatever fits your need. But today I want to talk to you about some audio, um, some audio things. And I want to thank our sponsor today, uh, StreamYard. Uh, which is uh, the very same um, software I use to stream to you guys like this. Um, streaming that's a really simple and easy to use uh, streaming soft uh, a streaming service that's actually web based where you're actually connecting through the web. You don't have to download any software and you can create an account and use it for free and start creating streams that look like this today. Uh, I'll put a link down below in the description. If you're interested, go there, try it out, see if you like it. Um, and so thank you for StreamYard for allowing us to do these kind of things on the channel and help creators uh, make better content. Uh, so today I want to talk to you a little bit about one of the softwares I use. I've mentioned it in the past. It's called Reaper. I can show you what it looks like here. Let me uh, let me pull this up. This is Reaper, um, and it may look confusing because I've got a huge project in here. If you look, there's all kinds of tracks. This is actually the um, the water drop um, effect that I had done recently, you know, and it, it had a bunch of layers to it. You can see I've got, you know, layer after layer after layer. And I explained exactly kind of what each layer was in my recent video. Uh, but a basic, uh, a basic project starts looking like this. It's very blank, much like any of your video editors before you brought anything in. 
and you literally start, you know, building, insert a new track and you start building a track and for every track you insert, it puts a master controller down underneath a fader. So when you look at um, some of the more advanced ones that I've done, I've just kept adding tracks and for every track, it adds a new layer, it's just like your video editing software. And I did really cover how to install this software, set it up, get it running um, on, a, on a live stream I did not that long ago. And I'll link that down in the description afterwards too so you guys can figure that out um, and give it a test. It's got a really long trial period too. They, the price, it's really cheap. I think it's like $60 for a lifetime, members, uh, lifetime license. But they have a super long trial period that's pretty much an honor system thing where if you, know, you get to try it, um, then it'll just have a pop-up and you can keep testing it. Um, and it's fully functional. They don't limit anything when you're testing it out. Um, so you can sit there and try it for, you know, 60 days, whatever you want, and and really get a feel for if it's something you want to um, put the money into. I do recommend they don't cram it down your throat to pay for the license. They do remind you every time you start the software, you know, you know, all right, would you like to buy a license? And if you don't, you can say I'm still testing it out. But it's, that's what I love about them. They're very low pressure, really cool company. Um, uh, and that's why I like their software. And it reminds me of the old school... Um, it reminds me of being in a, in a recording studio. It's one of the things I really like about um, this software is it does rem it does feel like being back in the recording studio where this lower section really feels, let me make this bigger, feels like a mixing board with each fader here dialed in and the controls for each. It gets very advanced and you can put effects on each track that you got going on and add them in. Um, and it's, and this is a lot of times people will ask me these questions like, Daniel, how do I, how do I, um, take like an audio and improve it and make it sound better? A lot of people will say to me, like your audio usually sounds pretty good. I'm a fan of always making sure that you start with, start with something solid. You don't have to buy these kind of expensive mics and preamps that I use. You can use something as simple as. Um, a lavalier mic. I a lot of times I'll record on the go with a Boya BYM1 lav mic. It pins right to my chest, and they're about twenty dollars US. Um, and they plug right into phones. They have they plug right into cameras. They don't need any preamps in them. They just kind of run and gun and go. And you can grab those little lavalier twenty dollar microphones and really make them sound great if you know how to. Um, equalize and compress the audio and you know what you're looking for to get the audio to sound a little better than it does. Um, and that's one of the one of the things I want to talk about. We'll start with the basics here. If you had, if you were using something like Reaper, let me open this up and you added, you would right click anywhere in here and you would say, insert a new track and here's my new track, right? So that's the first track I'm working with. Um, and I'm going to go up to the upper left and it'll say insert and I'll click on media file and then I can find anything I want that might, that I want to bring into um, Reaper. Let me see what I have in here. What have I done recently? Let's try cinematic sound, my audio. I believe um, I actually used, which one did I use? I'm trying to see which one of my, my intro. Let's see if I can get my voice somewhere where I talk. Um, grab one of these, these blank ones here and see what happens. I don't know what I was saying here or if you can hear this one, but this is this is just a simple um this is just a simple audio file. This is probably my microphone that I was using at the time. A lot of times I'll record my audio um and I will bring it into like Reaper and I'll try to improve Yeah, so this is me. I was talking into a microphone. So one of the things you can do um I'm going to kill that so it's not playing over. But this is your basic audio. And if you see uh, in the track down in the lower left here, I'll make this a little bigger. One of the things you can do, the things I like about a good digital audio workstation is in the track, it has above it an FX panel. And you can click on the effects. And you can choose effects to add to it. Um, one of the ones I love using is an advanced um, EQ. This particular one is a, um, is a parametric EQ. I don't know if you guys understand the difference between parametric and graphic. Let me see if I can explain this. Um, a, param a graphic EQ you may have seen before. It's the one that you'll see like in things like Filmora, where it has all the little bars, right? And you know the bars to the left uh, control the bass and then the ones to the right control the high end. And you kind of dial them up and down to create like a wave that makes sense um, to your audio. Um, and that's the, that's the graphic EQ. Now, parametric EQ works a little bit different where it uses knobs where it'll, you'll sweep. It'll actually say like, all right, like a decent one will have the lows, the mid lows, the mid highs, and the highs. 
and in the midsection, it'll allow you to sweep them. So it'll say, all right, let's take a curve in the that in that EQ section um, and we'll define where the center of that curve is and then decide whether to drop that down or bring it up. Um, and that's, you're basically sweeping out a curve. So if you want a parametric EQ, you'd be slowly dialing in, right? Um, like a like a dip and then have it come back up and in a, in a um, parametric, that's a graphic where you, you dial in a dip and a parametric, you can actually pull it out. So a lot of times I'll use these kind of things and I'll say, okay, um, let me take a look um, at this and I'll decide like, okay, here's the hit point right here is dead zero. Let me go, let me say right about, you know, 500K, which is the low, I can decide if I want a narrow band or a wider band. And then I can either pull that band back. So I'm pulling out the mid lows in a band that are centered around 500, or I can bring them back up and I can do the same with the um, mid highs. And then there's, here's your lows. That's why you're seeing two knobs for each, right? So it's your center of your low frequency. Um, and then whether you're pulling it out or bringing it back up, uh, and then the same with the high, you find your high Q and then you decide where you're going to put it and bring it up or bring it down. So it's, it's a little, it's a lot deeper than your standard, um, you know, uh, graphic EQ where you're just sliding faders and going out of that frequency, this frequency, which can get a little bit, if you ever heard it sounds kind of, um, ro robotic, I think sometimes EQs get very robotic, um, do you, uh, don't you think that a wide band will get better quality, a wider band? No, I, I, I don't. If you're talking about EQ, is that what you're asking, Bunce Forever? One of the things about wider bands um, is, yeah, you get like a really wide graphic EQ, but you're still doing the same thing because if you start, they're good sometimes. I use graphic EQs if I find singular problematic frequencies. If something's like woofing in a weird frequency or, or honking, um, a lot of times I'll grab that one frequency if I could hear it giving problems and I'll use a graphic EQ to kind of dial that one frequency out without changing the entire low end of my audio. Or if there's a, you know, if there's a, a hum somewhere, like if there's a little wind noise, I can find those few frequencies and yank them out. It's good for when there's background hiss and things like that. But parametrics are more, are what we always used to use in the recording studios because they're more natural. They make, they create EQ curves instead of harsh pulling out and harsh bringing things up. So the smoothness of a parametric EQ is, is the thing that I, I prefer. Um, before I get too far ahead of myself, let me make sure I'm paying attention to the comments here. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, one of the questions came from, um, uh, Bhagavan and he asked, uh, what is the best software? I, uh, is, is Mixcraft nine good? It's okay. I, I think Mixcraft's decent. Um, I don't have anything against that. I, uh, my preference is, is Reaper. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm usually the one that's trying to find an audio software that makes a lot of sense. Um, that, uh, that gives me the most flexibility and functionality. Um, and because I was a professional musician and I spent a lot of years in recording studios, behind some of the, you know, most expensive gear that you can own, Neve, uh, Neve consoles, the big SSLs, you know, with guys like, you know, the, you know, the guys from Aerosmith and some of the biggest producers in the world, Bob St. John, guys that produced number one, you know, hits uh, for bands like Extreme. So I'm, I'm used to, I'm used to being behind these, the, being in these studios with these big consoles back in the day. And, and nowadays it's like, you know, we have so much software, you can do that at home that I think learning to find one, again, one that works for you. A lot of people lean on Audacity. I think Audacity is pretty good, but it's free, it's limited. It doesn't allow you to put a lot of plugins. The plugins are important. When I'm talking about plugins for your audio, like I have this audio track here, right? This EQ is a, is a, is a VST plugin. It's a VST is just a fancy name. It's a, it's a type of um, insert, um, that was, it's like an add-on that was designed by the company Steinberg. They own the licensing to it. Um, and it allows you, it's a basically like a, a virtual, it's a virtual um, a virtual uh, patch. <laughs> it's technically, it can, it can be also instruments too, but it's a virtual patch you drop in and you're like here, instead of having, you know, back in the day, I always say like, if you ever were, have you ever seen a guitar pe uh, player, they'll have like on stage, some of them will have pedals, though their guitar plugs into a pedal, then goes into the amp and the pedal will be like distortion or, or reverb or something that's an effect. Well, in uh, in a real good digital audio workstation, your effects are VST plugins where you go, oh, you need an EQ, find a VST plugin. And the ones I'm showing you here are actually free. I'm a huge fan of free VST plugins. Um, because there's a lot of great ones out there that do the job. Um, and I linked all of these in my other video too, so you can find them afterwards and download them and try them. Um, I, I like a decent EQ. I also like a good compressor. 
Um, EQ is one thing. When you're looking at the, um, let me start here. Let me see if I can have this make sense. One of the very first things I think you should be aware of is how to add a spectrum analyzer. Here's a great um, spectrum analyzer called Span by Vox, uh, Voxenjo. I don't even know how to pronounce their name. But what it does is uh, if you're playing an audio track, I think I have this audio down, hopefully, what you'll see happen is um, as you play it, see this graph? This is basically telling me what my audio looks like. You know, everything here is the lows, everything here is the highs. You can see I don't have a lot of super lows in it. That's why it's not going way low. Your voice, you really don't want to be down in the like the lower 60 hertz and things like that because that's that thumping boom. Um, you know, that microphones, you know, when you ever hear that, you know, you get that really strong pulse when someone talks too hard on a mic and it like booms. Um, those are the things you, in real life, people's voices don't do that. So having a spectrum analyzer where you can look at your audio and say, okay, let me loop this so I can just have it play in a circle. Um, this is just playing my voice over and over and I can look at it and go, oh, it's a little hotter up top. Um, it's missing some of the lows in here. And one of the great things, if you have a good spectrum analyzer, see that dip right in there where it seems to be missing some lows? I can hover over that. And if you look right up here, see in this corner, it'll tell you what the frequency is. So I'm like, yeah, right about 196 hertz. Let me make that bigger so you can see it a little better. I can go ah, right about 196, 200, 198, right in there. There's a dip that I wish uh, that my microphone doesn't really isn't really picking up. So you can go in and you can put an EQ in and go, all right, let me try that. Let me start going right about the two, just under 200 range. So it's right, like I take, that's a mid-low. And if you see, this is where it starts saying 1.5, um, you know, get up there, it's, there's three, 3 point, uh, 350. I can go, let me get right in here. Let me do a, a shallower curve and let me boost that up a little bit and see if I can get that to sound a little richer. Um, so that when I play it back and I look at my, um, and I look at my spectrum analyzer, I can go, okay, let me see if I can bring this up in that area. Maybe I need a bit of a, a wider curve in there to help round out some of that. And you can start bringing up, you can see, I start building some of those out. And as I, as I bring those up, it starts rounding out some of the bottom end. And you can even bring up like a lot of the bottom end here and start deciding how do I get this to really start um, hitting a little more powerfully. You can also do things like, you know, as you can see, these are nice and soft. I can do like in the top end here, you can see now the lower end is starting to keep up a little better. That's one of the reasons I like um, things like a, a parametric EQ as opposed to graphic. It's a lot smoother um, transition of what's going on. So things like learning how to use those, you're gonna find also that your voice is going, to, each one of our voices is different and each one of the microphones we use is different. I usually try to remember that in a perfect world, um, a flat a flat EQ is almost like a curve. It should be kind of like this, like, you know, you don't want super high, super high spiking way up or a lot of lows spiking way up, especially in a vocal. They should be a little bit of a softer curve. It should come, you know, start, you know, the low end should kind of come up in the top end because our vocals represent a lot of that mid range. So when you're dialing in a mic, I usually try to flatten things out and then I start tweaking it a bit from there to try to get it, um, to somewhere where it makes a lot of sense for me. Um, let me see what uh, what Marlon's bringing. EQ equalizer, absolutely. Thank you, Marlon. Marlon's got a great, by the way, anyone interested to go really deep dive, um, White Noise Studio, my friend Marlon, um, is is like the resource. If you want to deep dive into, you know, um, like the heavier end of like audio production, uh, things like VST plugins that are out there. If you want to hear them, what they sound like, Marlon's got a great, absolutely um, go over to his channel and check him out because he goes really, really in deep on daily stuff, stuff that's coming out where it's expensive, where it's not expensive, what's free, how it works and how to use them in depth. Um, is that my boy, Justin? Hey, <laughs> thanks, Justin. Uh, you are the best battalion chief around. Thank you so much, pal. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure having you in the group. Um, yeah, so one of the things you want to think about is when you're trying to uh, learn about your what all what you know the EQ and things like that you're adding. Having a spectrum analyzer makes all the difference in the world because it allows you to actually see the EQ curve and you can find spikes and go, oh, I'm a little heavy here, I'm a little heavy there, and you have you in real time you can kind of not only hear what you're doing but you can see you can actually visually see where might some prob some prob uh, problematic frequencies might be if you do need the graphic to pull out one or lift one. It's a really good way. It's not the perfect way to mix. I never recommend that people mix just to a spectrum analyzer because um, a lot of it is what you hear. You have to learn to listen um, and train your ears to hear 
um, you know, what sounds good and what doesn't sound good. A lot of that begins with a decent set of monitors. I use studio reference monitors that I have mounted up in the sky up here. So I've got them, I've got them mounted like up above in my, uh, the catastrophe that is my, my, you can see one of them here and one of them here and they come down and I use those so that when I'm mixing here at my desk, that um that I have really well balanced monitors that are nice and flat and when I know I know that they're not um like regular home speakers. One of the things you got to consider too if you're doing audio, try investing in a, a decent set of near field reference monitors um, and make sure that they're reasonably flat. And the reason being is if you're mixing audio for your videos, right, and you go, oh, I I think it needs <clears throat> it sounds a little it needs more bass, right? It sounds a little thin. I need to put more bass in. You want to make sure that that's actually what you're hearing on the recording and not your speakers um, not adding bass or maybe they call it being colored. Like your speakers may not have a lot of low end and you and you start compensating by trying to crank it up in the, you know, the audio edit that you're doing. And then what happens when someone else hears it on a different set of speakers, it's got way too much bass and then it starts overwhelming um the what they're hearing because what you heard in your studio isn't really true so you want to try to find a decent set of near field reference monitors and that's where that spectrum analyzer can really help because if you, you can look and see you know am i adding too much bass does it look like that low end is really starting to peak too much in the analyzer and so you learning those really those simple basics um can help a lot i think a lot of people eq the two the two biggest things i or let me give you three i think eq is a great one you know a decent eq this one's got a little tube preamp simulation that puts a little bit of uh, compression on it and warms it up a little bit. That's why I like that one. I think it's a decent sounding EQ. Another thing you want to look into is a compressor and limiter. Um, let me just take that out of the search bar. Uh, one of the ones I like is uh, Density um, by uh, Variety of Sound. They do a nice job. <clears throat> so right here is a compressor. And if you don't know what a compressor is, uh, a compressor, this is the reason you see double layers here. This is a stereo compressor, so it handles left and right at the same time. Um, you can link them or do them independently. And if you're using a stereo or mono track, it doesn't matter. Um, but if you're trying to, if you ever notice sometimes, like if you're talking to a mic, the the volume sometimes will get super quiet, like if you get too far back or if you get louder. Um, and those peaks and valleys in your audio, you can you you try to put that under your video and sometimes it's like, oh, it's too quiet here, it's too loud there. And you spend a lot of time sitting in your um in your mix trying to, you know, bring it up, bring it down. What a compressor does is it takes those levels and it says, I'm gonna take the quiet parts and bring them up a bit and the really loud parts, I'm gonna squash them down a bit and try to average them out. And you dial in the, how much compression um, that you're gonna put. I won't go super deep into it. There's soft knee, there's hard knee, but in any given um, situation, if you were running it, you can see like if I bring, bring up the drive on this, right? It'll just start flattening out the levels. Um, and here's a good example. Let me see if I can show you this in real time. So here is, if you look at the waveform up top, right? Check out that waveform. See how it's up and down and up and down and up and down through this whole section. If I don't have any compression on it um, currently, you'll watch the meters over here on the left. See the master meters on the low left, they're jumping up and down. Sometimes they go way high, sometimes they are lower and they're higher and then they're lower. So adding compression, what that does is it flattens that out. So you can, you know, you can bring some compression into it and um, decide how hard you want to hit that. Um, and what it does is it starts to see the, 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 see where it's peaking. That peak doesn't jump around all over the place now um, because it starts adding that little bit of compression and squashes it down. Um, you can also switch these, I should say, down in the lower left. One of the reasons I like this one is there's a switch in the low, uh, sorry, the lower right that see it says limit, that says compression or limit, comp or limit. And a limiter is another um, is another form of compression where instead of bringing everything up and bringing everything down, it more like creates a ceiling and says, we won't let things go past this certain point. And that's what you're, you're limiting it. So you say, I won't let it get too loud. So you you can use those in tandem. A lot of times when I mix, I'll put a little bit of compression on to smooth to get to smooth the whole thing out. And then I'll add some limiting on top that sort of goes, here's the ceiling, let's create, let's hit it and get it up and, and make sure that we've really, don't let like huge jumps go way up. Uh, and that's another layer on top to help smooth out your um, your audio, which is exactly what um, Teja's uh, Grip the Music was doing. What does compression do? Right, so that's it, right? You're thinking about those ups and downs, quiet points, loud points, and you're going, 
I don't want it to sound like I'm screaming, but I don't want the quiet parts to make someone have to lean in and go, I can't, you know, why is that? I have to lean in and turn it up to hear it. What that does is the compression does that. It still makes it sound like you're talking quiet, but it's almost like if I'm talking loud here and I'm this far from the mic, what a compressor does is if I get quiet, it'll make it sound like this though. Even though I'm talking quiet, it brings it up. It's almost like I got closer to the mic. It kind of does that in real life in real time where it'll go, oh, if you're being quieter, I should raise the volume, like if you were getting close to the mic, so that people can hear the quiet part instead of being back here and going, I can't quite hear what he's saying. See, so that's that's what the compressor does. Um, really, really important. EQ compression, uh, very important. Another thing that's important um, is using noise gates. If you guys don't know what noise gates are, um, a noise gate is, uh, um, is, a, is a tool that allows, um, the software to close up and there's a lot of these come built right into um into reaper what it does is this one's not as pretty because it's built into reaper it doesn't have the cool ui but basically what it does is <clears throat> if there's any spots where maybe i'm not talking you know and I'm, I'm let's say i'm i'm editing my audio or i'm trying to make it sound better if you're out there and you're like i stopped talking but then i, I could hear like the the fan in the room or the ac or i could hear street noise um, so the minute I stop talking, you could hear more of the stuff around me and compression will do that too. When you add compression, if you stop talking, the compression will bring up some of those floor noise sounds too. floor noise is sort of what we refer to as ambient noise that might be going on that basic stuff that's happening in the background. So putting things like a noise gate, what a noise gate does is it's well, it's well named when you're not, when you're not talking or speaking, the gate closes and it shuts off the audio. Um, and you can adjust the level of when you want it to hit. So if I were like setting a noise gate here, right? I can go, okay, anything, anytime it drops below this where I set the fader, it's gonna close the gate. If I had the gate above, you wouldn't hear a, see how, let me see if I can make this bigger so you can see it. I wanna make sure that I'm uh, showing. You can see exactly how it's happening. See how this, this represents, the two green lines bouncing represents the sound coming in, okay? This meter out here, on the right represents the audio going out. I've got the gate set above the threshold of the volume of the stuff coming in, so it's not sending anything out. The gate is closed, but I can bring the gate down and go, okay, once it gets into the green, now you can see it's allowing that to go out. And, and you know, the noise floor may be um, somewhere lower. Let me go, I'm gonna grab a longer stretch up here where it gets quiet. Like where it gets quiet, the noise floor might be way down here. So I might say, okay, when I'm talking, it starts at about here and then goes up. But anything below that is usually just the background noise. And you set the gate so that that gate opens and closes um, around your your vocal. And you can set how hard the gate swings. So it's not just a chop off. It like it'll fade into the closing, and then you know, and you can set the attack of how quickly it opens up when you start talking again. And that's really good for noise reduction. Um, it's a gate is a great way when you want to just sort of um, quiet all those sections in between speaking, um, setting up a noise gate properly can be, um, can be really, really helpful so that, uh, so that what you've got, um, on your audio isn't like, Oh, we stopped talking and it's super noise. You know, I'm hearing like the fan and stuff. It'll close that up for you. Uh, let me make sure I'm paying attention to the comments here. Sometimes I get a, a little lost in the conversation. Um, uh, uh, Ray Danis asks, uh, is it all right if I just raise the volume for videos and let the audience handle the audio on their end? Not really. Um, the problem with that is if you just raise the audio, one of the things you're going to learn making video content um, is if you've ever done this, how many of you guys have ever had this happen? <clears throat> if you are aware of this, if, if you've had this happen, give me a hashtag yes in the chat. If you haven't had it happen, then give me a hashtag no. But you ever watch like um, television and you'll be watching like a TV show or something and then the commercials come on and they're like five times louder than the show you were watching. Uh, and also that like overwhelms you or you'll be watching a movie where like they'll be talking and you can't quite hear it and you turn it up. And then all of a sudden it's like they get to the explosion part and it's so loud. It's like, oh, I got to turn it back down. My friend, you know, my girlfriend's sleeping in the other room. That ever happened? It happens to me. It happens to me a lot. And that's a good example of what um, compression and limiting is, is good for like in your own track, you don't want someone on the other end going, ah, he's too loud there. Oh, he's too quiet. I'm turning him up because it becomes a hassle for the person on the other end trying to deal with your audio issues. You really want to make sure, cause it's not just volume. You want your EQ to sound good. Cause your mic might be abrasive. The mic tone that you have might not be smooth and round and warm. Like this particular mic I run through, I run this one through. If you see here, 
<clears throat> on this side, I have a Rodecaster Pro. That's what's over here. And that's handling all of this microphone. And it's adding a little EQ. It's adding a little compression. It's adding a little noise gate. Um, you know, a couple of little things. It brightens it up a little bit so that it's a little smoother. So that um, so it's war a little warmer and rounder sounding than if I didn't have any of those effects on. Uh, and it's important for me, live streaming, I want the experience to be good for you guys too. I want it to sound good. I, got, I want it to look good. And if it doesn't, you guys would be like, oh, I watched his live streamers videos, but the microphone just, it's annoying. It's abrasive. It's, uh, it hurts my ears. After listening for a few minutes, it's like, some people might say that about my voice. <laughs> Never mind. Them. So, sometimes the microphone can't get away. I can't help you there, right? Sometimes I'm just annoying and it might be that. But, the, you know, the sound of a microphone is important. And a really important thing is um, uh, each one of us has a different tonality. So the way you would sound on this microphone as opposed to how I would sound on this microphone is very different because our own voices, you know, some people have deeper voices, higher voices. So I'm a big fan of trying to find a microphone that kind of works for your voice that when you plug it in right out of the gate, you automatically go, oh, that I sound good on this microphone. And it doesn't have to be super expensive. I used an Audio-Technica AT2020. It's still over in the corner in my other, it's, I've got it um, way over there. I don't know if you can see it. It's right here. My finger's touching it. It's in a boom arm right there. And that one I use um, when I'm over in the editing booth. It's similar. It's not as warm as this. It's a little more crisp on the top end. Um, and that one works pretty well, too. So it's finding a, finding a microphone that works for your tonality is really, um, really important. Uh, quick question in here. Um, uh, Mahmoud Hawa asked, uh, how can I remove noise from the background? What do you think about Audacity? Yeah, I said it before. I think Audacity is uh, different, uh, Mahmoud, but uh, it's, it's decent, but it's an open source limited software and you can't, you can add some VST plugins, but it's like you have to add them and you can't go back in and tweak them as much. It's like the way Audacity works, it's not like Reaper where you can add an effect and it's interactive at all times. When I'm using Reaper, and I add an effect, I can go right back in and go, ah, that was a little too much high end. Let me pull a little bit of the mid highs out here. And then it's it's on the go. It's all real time. Whereas Audacity, it's almost like you have to set it and apply it to the track. They may have improved it, but the, you know, as of a year ago, it was still doing the same thing. The, there's not that much con, um, controllability. Um, it is free. That's a good thing about it. But I, I personally find it be, to be problematic. The biggest problem I have with Audacity is no video support. Here's something I should point out why I like Reaper. Um, let me open my recent file here where I was, the one I did, if you guys had seen the video, I did the water drop. Um, no, I don't need to save this. So I did that water drop, right? So here, what I did was, you can do this in Reaper and you cannot do this in Audacity, uh, is uh, at least as far as I've been able to tell, I've never been able to do it. I've looked for plugins that they've added on. And I've never been able to see it clean. You can bring a. I've brought a video track in here. This very first track up top, see that it has no sound? It's a video track, all right? Now, if you brought a video track into Audacity, it can, I like Audacity because it will, it will pull the audio from that video track and treat it as an audio track. But the thing that it can't do is this. If you go under view, I, whoops, sorry, view, and I click on video, it automatically, let me unpin this, I'm going to undock it. It gives me a video track so that I now have this video going on and I can sit here and I can edit to that video track in Reaper. I can also drag this into another screen if I want so that I can put it full screen on a second monitor so I can sit here and I can I can edit my audio to the beat, like literally to the, whatever I'm seeing. I, I, if I filmed myself, I can be looking at it. If there were key points, if I did an entire edit, I can bring it in here and go, now I can create that, um, that the soundscape to go with the video. And you can also do things like um, you can dock it. That's what I'm calling docked right here. So now it's underneath. It's not blocking any of my screens. So when I do this kind of stuff and I'm working out my soundscapes, I'm sitting here looking at the video in my digital audio workstation, and that allows me to start building around it, right? That's one of the things that Audacity doesn't do very well. Um, I wish it did. So that's... that's um. That's one of the biggest benefits for uh, for video content creators, which is really who I'm speaking to today, right? There's if you're just an audio person and you just want to get something free and get and start using it, yeah, Audacity is pretty good. And if you just wanted to take a microphone track that you exported and try to improve some of the, the quality of the sound, yeah, Audacity can do that. Real simple, basic audio stuff. Um, it does it. It's just not as 
fully functional as something like Reaper, where I can go in and I can bring my entire video project. I did the video edit, I can bring it in and now I can start layering, right? Maybe I want, maybe I had a whole thing where it was just my voice and I wanted to create a whole musical bed that went up, went down, stopped, cut, put in some sound effects. I can bring that video in, uh, create a whole nother layer and then just t export that audio track and drop it into my video project. And there it is, you know, pretty much time aligned. Sometimes you can do a little adjustments, uh, but it's time aligned where I can go, oh, perfect. Now here's, I've edited the entire sound to the video. Super, super powerful. Um, so, so like I said, the things you want to start with is the equalization, EQ, um, compression, uh, or limiting. Um, make sure you have a decent spectrum analyzer so you can see what's going on with the EQ curve of whatever you're dealing with. That'll help you recognize some of the spots uh, where you find problems. As I was saying before, um, like here's an example of the different things I've got layered. I've One of the things I really like about, about Reaper too, hold on, let me make sure I'm showing my screen. Um, one of the things I like about Reaper is not only can you um, add, let me undock this in here. I'm gonna undock that and I'm gonna unview it. Not only can you add, each one of these tracks has the ability to add effects above it. I can click on that and that's it, whatever effect I've added to the individual track. Um, but then it has the master over here and you can grab the master and this will add a series of effects to the entire mix. So I can sit here and go, oh, I wanna add, you know, whatever I wanna add, more EQ, more compression. Um, I use all sorts of different things in general when I'm trying to build something out <clears throat> and create the sound that I wanna get. So I can, I can individually add effects. You can create what they call a bus, which means you can have you know, four of those tracks go to one track and then it puts the same effect on just four of those tracks. And then you can do the master, you can create many buses. Um, and then I'll, and then you can have them all send to the master where you put on master effects that affects everything that's going in the export. If you don't know what tracks, buses, and the master is, tracks are your individual tracks. The best way I can explain that is let's say, uh, let's say you were in a band and you had, um, and you wanted to, you had like four tracks of guitar and you wanted every guitar to have a, you know, you, you have a certain EQ. You could send all four tracks to a bus, puts them all into one category, into one fader, add that EQ to the one bus and it'll EQ everything or put reverb on every, on all, just those tracks, then send it to them. Then it goes to the master, right? So you can group subgroups underneath each and create those layers of track to bus out to the master and put effects all along the way so that you're not going to four different tracks and duplicating all the same effects on each track, send them to a bus and go, okay, that those four tracks are going to get this effect. Uh, we got a super chat right here. Blaine Lockler. Hi, Dan. I saw you were live. Just a note to say hello. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for your help with my channel. Much appreciated. Blaine, I appreciate the super chat, my friend. Uh, it always helps me uh, do these kind of things when people pitch in, throw a little cash my way, helps me buy the tools to do this. And uh, always a pleasure working with you, my friend. Um, I wish you nothing but success. Keep me posted on how everything's going over there. Um, let's see, what are we talking about here? Uh, I'm gonna look at a couple of questions here. Can I use a voice auto-tuner auto to fix your horrible voice? This is one of the things, okay, so an auto-tuner, it's a good question. An auto-tuner is a little different. An auto-tuner doesn't fix your voice. An auto-tuner takes whatever you're saying and tunes it to a specific pitch, right? Meaning meaning if, if you set it to go like, oh, <clears throat> I'm trying to sing, um, and I keep going a little sharp, it'll take that, if you're trying to hit an A and you're A sharp, it'll bring it down to the A. So that's what an auto tuner does. You're physically tuning the voice. What you're talking about is a, what you're really talking about is a pitch shifter. You can, a, a decent pitch shifter, which is really funny. Um, I did this, my girlfriend helped me on a video once where she had said something, she read a line for me. It was one where I did in Filmora, I had blurred my face out um, and she was, um, supposed to be representing, you know, she had to say a line where like, sir, we can see you. Um, but her voice, I want, I didn't want it to, I wanted to change her voice. So I pitched it down a couple, you know, like a half a cent and she was freaked out. She goes, that doesn't even sound like me because it made her voice deeper, not so much deeper that it was like an alien, but you can do that in simple things like film more, you can pitch them down, but, um, higher end software, like when you use like a digital audio workstation, like Reaper will allow you to, um, yeah, do slight pitch shifts. So if you had a track. Um, if you had an audio track and you open it up, you could absolutely just go into like here, if you wanted to add an effect and you hit pitch, um, you can absolutely, the, um, Reaper comes with, with, with six or seven different built-in pitch shifters. I think I like the, uh, I don't remember which I think the, is it the RE pit, re pitch is the one I think I've used a few times where you can do, this gives you all this control right here. Let me make it a little bigger so you can see it. 
um, gives you all this control here where you can do all kinds of wet, dry. You can mix the amount of pitch shift, full range, uh, individual scents, semitones, full octaves. You know, you guys have probably used like the pitch shifter in something like Filmora. It's very robotic. It pitches full steps and that's it. A good pitch shifter will actually give you all these halftone, semitones, and you can start dialing down little tiny increments of which portions of the audio gets um, mixed. And you can mix your dry back in a little bit to make it feel a little more authentic. I love um, I love using this a lot. You know what I use the pitch shift for a lot? Um, I use it for, if you saw my latest uh, video where I did the water drop, I would get effects like I had done the effect with a water drop hit. Um, well, I can show you. I've got it right in front of me. I did the water drop actually hit um, and did a water splash, right? So there was a... Um, I found a splash, the water splash right here. That was this effect on this track. Um, if I highlight it there, it'll show it down here and I can open up the effects for this track. And in this one, I added some reverb. That's a free reverb called uh, Oral River. And I used the repitch again right here next to it. And you can see these, I've pitched it all down because what happened was the original splash effect was, was sounded like water splashing. But the, the video I made was very super slow-mo and the sound of something hitting slow and then the sound of water in real time didn't make any sense to me. It was like, fat, it sounded like splash. And it was, but in the, what you were seeing was like this slow water explosion. I'm like, all right, you know, how do I make that happen? So I took that sound effect, which was one of the ones I layered into 16 other effects and I pitched it down. So it was, instead of being like a regular water splash, it was like, it was slowed down and lower. And it was just, it wasn't necessarily slowed down, but the pitch was lower brought it way down, and then I put a little reverb on so it sounded cavernous. And those two things, pitch shifting the splash effect and then adding some reverb so the tail end of it echoed on and on um, is is something that really made that that splash effect sound a lot bigger than it did just um, <clears throat> just when I had started with the original, the original track. I get, uh, people ask me this question too, like sound effects and things like that. Where do you get sound effects? Um, there's a couple of really great places if you're looking to do um, add some stuff to your tracks. The first place I think that if you're making YouTube content, um, the first place I would tell you to go is go to um, the YouTube audio library, which is really easy to find if you go into your YouTube studio on desktop. It's actually linked in the drop down menu on the left where you can find YouTube audio and everything in there you're allowed to use on YouTube. There are certain things that you have to put an attribution, meaning you have to put a little bit of text they give you into your description, but it will tell you if you need to but they have music and they have sound effects and they're pretty good. I use them in a lot of my stuff um, and you can get that stuff and use it for free. Another one I use is Storyblocks. Um, and a lot of times I'll get like Storyblocks sound effects and when I'm on a live stream, I'll actually, you know, use them for, you know, in my live stream, I have the, you know, the soundboard and I'll add, you know, if some, someone's laughing or if something happens like that, a lot of times I'll be able to bring up those, those sound effects and, you know, hit sound. Crick, crickets, laughter, <laughs> things like that. You know, so sound effects are important. Can really can really help not only your video content but your live stream. Uh, so finding good resources for for them is is important. Um, so like I said, YouTube Audio Library. You start there because it's free. So anything you can use them. They're free. They're royalty free. Free to use as long as the con the content is hosted on YouTube. You can't take those music that music and effects and use them to create videos for like a client who's going to put it on their website. Um, it, can, it has to be hosted on YouTube. Something like storyblocks.com does video, audio. Um, it does video, audio, and images all at once. So you can get all three assets um, and you can buy a yearly subscription. I think it's like $250 for the year and you get all access to all that. You can create B-roll, you can get a sound effects. Everything I got for the water drop effect, I got from Storyblocks. So if you'd seen that, and I'm working on one, one right now. One of the things that I got asked a lot after making my last video is a lot of people ask me, okay, well, you kind of showed us like how to do this thing in the editing and you showed us how to add sound to it. How did you actually film? How do you film it? How do you get the, what do you got to do to make, to film something to make it look more cinematic, you know, to do the visual end. So I'm actually, I, I, I'm working on one right now that I'm going to actually show you a really simple setup and the way to get the lighting right and um, to film something so that you can film something to make it look cinematic right off the bat before it ever goes into your video editing software, right? Get it all looking really rich and full. Uh, and, and then when you bring it in, you can really take it to the next level and sell it. Uh, let me quick, take a quick, um, quick ch uh, check here. What soundboard model is that? 
Oh, this is um, this one here. I'm using is is the that's the uh, Rodecaster Pro, which has the built-in. Let me move the mic out of the way. You see those colored tabs? It's got it's got um, sound sections in there where I can, you know, I can use different sounds sound tabs. They give you different selections. Some of these I use. I switch them up, and <clears throat> sometimes I'll put like music I've recorded myself. Like this is stuff I actually wrote and recorded in here. <laughs> So, you know, that, that makes it really handy. You, you guys probably have heard some of the new music that I've written and recorded for my newer videos. I use this one a lot. So, yeah, you know, again, when it comes to sound, uh, because I'm a musician, uh, you know, I, I've relied on a lot of stuff I've gotten from either Epidemic Sound or YouTube Audio Library, but... I've got an entire wall of guitars behind behind me and I've got, you know, fractal amp right here. So it's like a lot of times I'll be like, what are you doing? Just, you know, write something that's your own um, so that my videos can sound different than everybody else's. So a lot of times, um, a lot of times I'll, I'll do that. I'll write my own music and use it as my own beds. It's a whole nother discussion we'll have sometime. Um, is there a reverb sound effect in Filmora? No, there isn't. And there's not one in Movavi either, which is why <clears throat> I like using Reaper because I can quickly go in and I can add any, you know, any one of those. If you look here, I think, which is the one I used here. I think it was the Ori is the one I think I like the most. Um, that was another VST plugin that you can add a really solid, uh, a fairly advanced EQ that has all the diffusion room sizes. Um, and there's a bunch of different ones. Reaper actually comes with, um, comes with a bunch of different preset uh reverbs in it if you put uh reverb i think you'll see or maybe i gotta actually say verb uh verb yeah um so there's i there's a few in here there's the uh reverb r r e a verb that's their built-in reverb that has some different presets you know uh that you can use and add on in there uh, and then you can find other ones that you may want to use as vst plugins and bring them in afterwards um, I wish that Filmora and Movavi had, Mo, Filmora has no effects, audio effects. And like I said, it has like pitch shift and stuff. You can do basic things, but it has no delays and stuff. I did a video video showing you how to create those delays by stacking um, tr video tracks and creating your own delay. Um, uh, Movavi does have some, it has the kind of stuff that I created in F Filmora. You can actually is built into Movavi, but neither one of them has a really good rich reverb. Um, and that's, I get that asked a lot. Like I, I reverb is something that people use a lot. They want to get that, not an echo, but that canon, that cavernous sound. Um, so that's why I, I don't even play that game. I'm like, I go right into uh, an editor that has VST plugins because no two reverbs are the same. That's another thing you're going to learn as you start playing around, like different VST plugins are going to act differently they have different tonality to them so you might decide oh I, I i don't like this reverb i do like that reverb one of these video editors might add a a reverb that you don't like and you want the ability to um you want the ability to go ahead and use a different one i believe da vinci and jay would tell me i think we talked about this i think da vinci resolves allows you to use vst plugins so you can just like we're doing here with reaper um you can bring in your own uh, plugins and decide which ones to use. The problem with that is it's, you know, it's more expensive. Um, da Vinci's $299, I think for a lifetime license. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, I got a question here, uh, from the, uh, the last ghost hunter said, Daniel Battelle is Cubase any good for video editing mixing? Yeah. Cubase is excellent. Uh, Cubase is Steinberg's version of what we're kind of seeing here. I use Cubase for years. They, they give it away with a lot of, um, their products. I think they were teamed with Alesis for a while. They may still be where if you bought some like an Alesis, I bought a multi mixer. I believe that little blue mixer right there on the other desk. When I bought that, I think it came with the, the, the Cubase studio that goes up to a, the higher end one. I believe they call Nuendo, uh, but it's great. That's another great one. Pro tools is another one you may have heard of a lot. Um, there's a lot, there's so many different digital audio workstations. I say find one you like and run with it. The reason I recommend Reaper is I think it's as good as all the other ones out there. Um, it has video support and you can download it right now and start using it today. No cost, just go for it and decide that it, they let you use it for a really extended period of time. 
Um, and then you can decide if you want to keep it. You can learn it. You can literally learn it and go, all right, I, I love this. I use it a lot. I'm going to, I'm going to pay for a license. And they're really cool like that. Where most of the other ones don't, uh, not that I'm aware of, Marlon can correct me on that. Don't have those, um, those, those real open ended trial periods. Um, Happy Gills Fishing asks, can you save an audio custom EQ setting? That is a great question. Here's one of the coolest things I like about Reaper. Anything you do, watch this one. Like, let's say I have this entire thing. I've got a whole stack of settings here, right? So these are all different VST plugins that I've stacked up on top of each other, each that was individually set. What you can do in Reaper, which I love, um, is I can go up to the effects tab up top here, click on that, and I can save this FX chain, right? Or I can save selected effects as a chain. I do this all the time. I'll get my mic sounding just the way I want and I'll save that chain, everything that's here in this list. It'll save all of those effects with the presets as a chain and then I can come back on a completely different project and go, oh, I'm using my Shure SM7B for this um, audio. Let me pull up my Shure SM7B effects chain that has all the EQ, compression, noise gate, de or sometimes if it's too crispy, sometimes the S's will get a little too SC and a de or will take that S away. And I'll save those as a chain and then I can come back and just go, oh, here I'm a new project. Let me click on effects, add this FX chain and bring that entire chain back in. You can save them, you know, just like you would anything else uh, as a file, wherever you'd like to put them. And it adds that entire chain. That's super, super powerful for me because sometimes I'm filming um, and I'm using like this mic. And then sometimes I'll be filming and I have a Sennheiser um, mic up here. That's a, a more expensive mic when I don't want the mic in the shot, right? If I don't want it hanging in my face, this one you have to be close to. Um, the Shure, which I love the Shure, it's a great mic, but you got to be right on top of it or it doesn't sound as good. So a lot of times I'll use, when I'm filming out of shot, I'll have this one right up here that does much better at a distance. It's this expensive boom uh, shotgun mic. And that one I'll use, and I, and I have a different set of um, effects because they, they sound different. They're a slightly different sounding microphone, obviously. So I'll set up something to make them sound similar. So that if I happen to go back and forth, a lot of times I'll film something in front of the camera like this, and then I'll switch over where I'm doing screen capture and I'm doing a voiceover using, could be either one of these mics. So I EQ them so that they both sound good for my, my vocal tones gets more rounded and similar. Um, yeah, so absolutely you can see, it was a fantastic question. Um, let me see, what are we talking about here? I'm just reading, uh, new member. Oh, do we have a new member? If I missed a membership, I apologize. If there are any new members that came in today, um, be sure to go over to my memberships tab um, and check out. Uh, there's a list of things that you now get as a channel member. One of those things is you um, get access to our private Facebook group and the link is there. If you click on it, just it'll bring you right to the, the private Facebook group. Just make sure you post your channel name or URL link to your channel so um, that I know who you are and I can let you in. Um, let me see what else is uh, Marlon saying. Cakewalk by uh, Band Labs, 100%. Oh, there we go. Cool. Yeah, Cakewalk is pretty good. I've used Cakewalk before. Eh, you know, the some of the UI is a little funky in Cakewalk. Um, I, I like it. It's not bad. It's just not my favorite. Um, but that's cool that it's 100% free. So there you go, Marlon. Uh, he is the resource. Um, I'm a big fan of, um, I say this about every video type of software, find the one that feels right to you, that looks right and feels right. Marlon, does Cakewalk um, support video? Can, can you support video playback? That's one of the things is a must for me. I have to be able to go, all right, I'm working on this and I want to be able to, um, I want to be able to make sure that I can bring up my video file for this because if I want to know what's happening, I want to be able to edit to my, to, to what I'm looking at. And if I can't do that, then that's a, that's a, that's a hard no for me. <laughs> no idea to be, it's no idea to be honest. Yeah. Um, that's one of those things that may or may not, we'll look into that. And if, if I find out something different, um, I'll talk to Marlon and we'll get some suggestions. Mar Marlon, we should do a show together. We should do a live stream together where we can cover some of this stuff. Um, I'd love to have you on, but, uh, yeah, that's, uh, definitely check out Marlon's channel. If you're, if you just came to the stream and didn't hear me say earlier, Marlon white noise studio, he goes super in deep into the super in depth to the kind of like VST plugins and softwares and things that are out there that are available and how to use them. Um, so great channel for that. Uh, let me see right here. The quick question is a great question. Do you recommend putting background music in videos? I, it depends. I love putting music in my videos and I like using it as hit points. A lot of times I'll like 
say something, introduce a video, and as I'm switching over to something else, I'll drop you know some music in there. I'm a big believer that music, because I'm a musician though, I might be jaded. It comes down to the type of content you're making and how the how your audience is consuming it. Um, I watch channels like Peter McKinnon who makes just amazingly great looking content and he uses a ton of music to create the atmosphere and he builds a soundscape. Um, so I'm a huge fan, you know, of channels like that, that look great, that sound great. Um, they can, music can really help tell a story and it can, and it can create a mood, even music way down in the background, I think creates a, a mood. Like you can create a happy mood, a more dramatic mood. Um, so depending on what you're doing, I think background music can, can totally take a video to the next level, but it's a skill just dropping music in doesn't, doesn't really do it. I think when I, on my latest video, um, you know, so I, I done this is I, I explained, um, that the bottom tracks of this one, if you can see, let me expand this a bit. So it's a little bit bigger. Um, what you're looking at here, these last three tracks is one song. And I had used the beginning of it to accentuate a certain part. So right here, I, I, I started accentuating, I used the beginning part of the piano keys and then I cropped it. And you can see all these little green lines. These are volume swells that I've automated into this track. So that's keyframed audio. Uh, and then I picked that song back up in two tracks right here and panned them left and right because this was the beginning of this track that was right on the beat when the water hit. Um, and then what I realized is I played this song through and got near the end of it. I started hearing like violins come in. I'm like, oh, those are awesome. I don't know if I want them to play I don't, I, I like them, but it, there was some stuff going on in the beginning that didn't happen after the violins came in. So I chopped that and I dragged it down to this track and just syn syncopated it, syncopated it. Wow. I can't speak today by stretching this way out. And I could really look at the beats. I could look at the waveforms here and I could say, all right, let me make sure I've got these, all of these little hit points. I can look at the divots and go, all right, let me get that. Let me stretch it way out and line up these divots to get that right on point so that that is really the beat was hitting right at the right point. Uh, and I just, I actually played that song over itself so that it had the strings from the end section and then the piano from the beginning section playing at the same time. So I love, I love audio, but I, I, I'm not a fan of just sticking something in, you know, it's as creators, the same way we play with, um, you know, B-roll and sound effects. Um, we want to create a soundscape so we want to layer and play with it and cut it and chop it and use it different ways. Uh, a lot of times I'll do videos where I'm not even using the same song throughout the video. I might do something at the beginning that creates a certain atmosphere and then it stops where I'm like talking into the mic and doing something and I'll jump to something else. And that song I was playing earlier didn't really help the new section I went to. So I'll create it. I'll bring in a different track that I think better represents that mood or that atmosphere and use that. Um, so yeah, I'm a huge fan of, I'm a huge fan of, of, uh, of using audio. Um, let's see, is that my boy V? Um, uh, what's up? Uh, I sent you a message earlier. My audio just stopped working in Filmora. Really? Um, you know, one of the things, if you have any problems with Filmora for any of the Filmora users out there, if you ever have a problem where audio or one of the functions just stops, um, first of all, number one, um, make sure you have the, um, the most recent version of Filmora uh, installed and don't just go to the help tab and go check for update. No, it says I have the latest version because it won't show you Filmora is constantly putting out patch fixes, bug fixes. So you, they won't necessarily show up in there until it's an official release. So always, I do this every like few days. I'll go to, I'll back up my project files, which I really don't keep anything in the Filmora files. Like they're all backed up off um, into an external hard drive. I'll, and I'll download, I'll re-download the software from the Filmora website. And so I know I have the latest version with the most recent bug fixes in it. That's the number one thing. Usually if there's a bug in one of the, if you find something's not working right, go and download, re-download it V and, and make sure you have the most recent version. It'll, it'll overwrite any bugs that, are, that were in the previous version you might have. <clears throat> They're on their like ninth version of Filmora 10, Filmora X right now. That's how many times they've fixed things in it that they found along the way. They're pretty responsive to when people say there's an issue, they get right out there and try to get, get a patch fix and get the new version out there. <clears throat> the other thing is make sure that your, your um, computer significantly exceeds the minimum system requirements. Um, I, 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 I'm assuming yours probably does because you've used Filmora for a while, but, uh, you know, as they keep updating the software, there's higher system demands and you can, you can run into some issues. 
Uh, so just make sure you're, you're, you're running the latest version and make sure that you're keeping your system well past. Don't just go with the minimum system requirements. Jay Littman and I covered that uh, in our Filmora versus DaVinci Resolve um, live stream. You never want to just go, oh, I, I just meet the minimum system requirements. So it's, you'll always have a bad experience. Um, uh, Raiden asked, any recommendations for a lapel mic, the one you clip on your shirt and the like? Yeah, the Boya, which is spelled B-O-Y-A, the Boya B-Y-M-1 is a great little mic. I keep it in my kit at all times. I said earlier, it's about $20. Um, it, it's a really great, it's got, um, it's got a high output. You don't, you can keep it fairly far away from your mouth and it'll still sound great. So it's a good, it's a good lapel mic in that sense that you don't have to have it right up close. It's actually pretty hot. If I get it too close, I can peak that mic cause I get loud sometimes, but you keep it down to the side. Sounds really good. Uh, 20, like 20 bucks us, um, sounds real. And it comes, you can plug right into your, I think it comes with all the adapters, a TR, TRS and TRRS, which I don't know if you know what those are, but it's, um, uh, if you look at any audio adapter, let me see if I can do this. Let me see if I can make that focus on this. All right. See how that has two tiny black rings. Okay. That tip you're looking at is a TRS. Don't pay attention to the black, um, sort of bands on it. Pay attention to the spots in between the gold. The T stands for tip, right? And the, um, the middle band of that gold in between the two black bars is the ring. And then the largest one at the bottom, the, lo the lowest part, that's the sleeve. So this is a standard stereo plug, tip ring sleeve, TRS. Um, the, those work with cameras. Um, but if you're trying to plug into a phone, if you're going to use a lapel mic with a phone, it'll have an extra black band and an extra ring. <clears throat> and that's called a TRRS type of um, input. Uh, I believe the Boya BYM one comes with both, so you can plug it into your camera or your phone. The reason the extra one is there is that phones use... Um, that same input as a microphone source, not just a they, uh, headphones and microphone all from one spot. So even if you're using like a, um, you know, like a, an Apple phone, an iPhone and you put like the dongle in, if you connect, it's still going to use a, a TRRS connector because it's thinking, oh, we're going to be listening and using a microphone at the same time. Cause a lot of headphones have like the, the microphone built right in this one, the one I'm using does. And so it's doing two functions at once. And that's why it has the extra ring sleeve. So you want to be, make sure you're using a lot of times people will buy one and they'll go like, I tried plugging it into my phone. It didn't work. Well, you had the, you had the, you had the wrong um, adapter on the end. You have to make sure you're using the right one. Um, what does this just say? Now we can appreciate your rings. Yeah. Appreciate my rings. <laughs> I've got many rings. I'm tip ring, 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 ring. Sleeve. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, can you drop a link for that, Mike? I will. I'll put it in the re I'll put it in the comments afterwards. The Boya BYM one. Absolutely, I will. Uh, great little mic. You know what I'm going to probably do? Uh, I've been meaning to do a video on this too. I said, I'm going to take that mic. A lot of people, get, they, they say, oh, you know, like, well, of course your voice sounds okay. You've got like expensive mics and stuff. I'm going to take, I'm going to take my Boya BYM one and I'm going to pin it to my lapel and I'm going to use Reaper and I will tweak that microphone and I'll show you how you can take a very flat, affordable microphone and make it sound really, really powerful um, using using some EQ compression, noise gates, things like that. And uh, that'll be really great. That'll be a, a, a and it'll uh, and maybe what I'll also do is I will save the effects chain and post it somewhere where you guys can download it. as long as you have Reaper and those VST plugins, you can drop it right in and go, oh, I can use Daniel's. Um, effects chain and get the and get the same you know the, the same EQ and whatever that he did. I'll put that together. It's been something I've been thinking about for a while, so that you guys can go out there get an affordable mic and really make it sound professional. Because stuff is expensive. It is expensive. You know, I've been fortunate. People give me super chats and we get sponsors in here. Like again, um, today, you know, this this stream itself is also co-sponsored by um, Spreadshop. Has been really great. If you guys if you guys uh, know anything about gear, right? If you know merch. <laughs> um, if you are interested, it's one of the things I talked about recently is how to, um, is how to, uh, you know, make money on, on YouTube if you're not monetized and Spreadshop is one of the things they're now integrated with the, the YouTube merch shelf. So if you look at my live stream, I've got some merch pinned above, pinned above at the top of the chat, that's all Spreadshop stuff. But even if you don't have the merch shelf on your channel, you can, um, set up a Spreadshop for free. You can make merch for free. It doesn't cost you anything to design t-shirts and have them ready. And Spreadshop does all the heavy lifting. Um, so you can, uh, you can actually start having t-shirts and things and they, they handle everything, the, the shipping, the cost and everything. And when you sell something, they make it, they ship it and they give you a piece of the profit. Love it. So, um, 
So yeah, like that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, we should talk more about that. I'll be covering that too, more revenue, because a lot of things we're talking about, even buying a $20 mic can be expensive. So if you can start doing things like a better revenue strategy so you can make a few bucks, you know, selling some cool t-shirts or coffee mugs or things like that or hats or whatever you might want to do, there's a million ways to do things. Something like Spreadshop can help you make the money to buy a boy, a BYM one and offset some of the expenses. Um, quick out here, shout out from the Philippines. David, hey, shout out right back at you, pal. Um, yeah, let me see if I can do this. So I'll, let me post it right here. The Boya B Y B Y M one. I'm going to post that in the chat. Just see the name of it, but I'll get a link to that, my friend, um, an actual link so you can find it more easily. Um, so, so if, if anyone's interested in trying out Reaper, as I said earlier, I have, um, I have a link to a video in the description of this live stream that you can click on, it sh it has it shows you how to install it. I've got links in that description showing you where to download um, where to download the software. I actually show you how to set it up, install it into your into your into your PC. I'm a PC guy, um, and how to run it. I believe it runs on PC, Mac, and Linux. Um, and I also listed all of the different effects that I've been using here today. I think it has every one of these. I showed you where the link to get the variety of sound EQ, where to get density, um, I pr pretty much where to get um, that Voxenjo span um, spectrum analyzer. So all of that stuff is in the video that I've got pinned down in the description. So if anything here, um, uh, um, Bo H says, yeah, I'm going to try Reaper. Absolutely, Bo. If you go download it, it literally everything runs. It'll have a pop-up window saying, you know, Reaper isn't free. You've got, you know, X amount of time to try it. But it's a virtually limitless trial period. And I don't recommend that people don't pay. If you like the software, um, if you've been using it for a couple of months, go, you know, pay, pay, give them the 60 bucks or whatever it is to buy it. Well worth the price because then you get all the updates free, all the pop-ups go away. But you can use it right now and it's fully functional. It does everything you need. Um, and all of those different, um, and all of those different uh, different VST plugins that are that I use um, are easily available. They've got so many great plugins out there. So I'm a huge fan. Uh, let me just check some quick questions from the chat here. Uh, Miroslav says, "Is it possible to um, export every audio clip from Filmora project and import it into Reaper, including some timestamps, so each individual audio clip stays in place?" Yeah. Well, if you <clears throat> if you did this, the way you would do that, Miroslav, is um, you would actually mute all the other tracks and export the project as an MP3 with one track on. Then you'd have to, you can't do it all at once. Um, and then you'd have to turn on a different track and say, okay, this is just my audio track and I'm gonna export that as an MP3. And usually they'll be already be time aligned, right? Because if the, the way Filmora works is it looks at your whole project and it exports whatever's turned on. So as long as you turn on one track and just export that as an MP3, it'll give you that first track. And maybe your next track is a sound effect. You can then turn on just the sound effect and expect and, and export that as your sound effect track. And then if you bring them all into Reaper and just line them up, they all should be pretty much in time. You might be, have to do a little bit of tweaking. Um, but this is why I do all my soundscaping in, in Reaper first. I don't like put everything in Filmora and then bring it into Reaper. I, I do my basics in Filmora. And then when I want to layer sounds and all those things, I do that all in, in Reaper because it's so much easier. And then I can just export the track as a stereo track and I've already got it dialed in. There are sometimes, I'll still add extra stuff when I'm in Filmora, but instead of having 90 tracks in Filmora of different little sound effects that I, that I know, I just want the timing to be right. I want it to sound right. I'd rather do it in a higher end digital audio workstation, nail it, and then come and then export it as one single stereo track, drop it into Filmora. Now I don't have 9 million tracks in Filmora. I've got all the cool stuff done, the effects all in there. And then I can just do like, you know, any overlays or swooshing sounds. Like sometimes I'll have text come in and make a swooshing sound, things like that. I'll add that in afterwards. I don't necessarily need to have that in my Reaper project. <clears throat> um, what's this question over here? I want you to make video on a Zach King effect. Yeah, I'm thinking about that. I think I'm going to do one. Um, I got another video I'm going to do for Movavi. I think I got one more in that series. And I was thinking about doing another Zach King because they're a lot of fun. Um, let's see. Uh, let's, uh, uh, Iora says, uh, hey, Daniel, one software for Create Music Easier, same GarageBand. Yeah, uh, for, or, but in Windows? Oh, so you're asking that question. If, yeah, if you have GarageBand, that comes free with a lot of the Apple products. And GarageBand is great for doing that kind of layering and stuff. Um, <clears throat> but like GarageBand, good question. Let me... Ask my pal Marlon, I'll get a recommendation and I'll pin it um, in the um, in the comments afterwards um, if there is something similar. I Like I said, for GarageBand is more of a, um, you're thinking for a mobile device, right? Is there something on like a, 
Well, you're saying, but in Windows, you mean on Android? I'm a little confused there. So if you're, if you're going to do Windows, if you're using Windows, that's like I said, I think Reaper is the way to go. I think Reaper beats them all. I just love it. Um, it's just my favorite software and you can go use it for free right now and really start learning it, which is great. Um, but for it, like a, like a mobile device, let me see if I can do something there. Um, a quick question here. Did you use any other software, audio software before Reaper? Yeah, I did. I used, I, we were talking about that earlier. I used Nuendo, which is the higher version of Cubase. I used, um, gosh, if I, I've, I've used Pro Tools. I've used, uh, Pro Tools was like the first one that came out that was like the big digital audio workstation. So a lot of us learned on Pro Tools first. <clears throat> I've used, um, there's been a lot of different ones. Um, I think there was like N-Track I used for a little bit. That was a more affordable one. Um, I've used... I've lost track. Um, so yeah, they're they're all very similar. Um, there's different ones I've used for different reasons. They have some of them just different layouts and the way the things you can do with some of them. Um, but in general, uh, Reaper has always been my favorite. I, I've used Audacity for simple things. If I just want to extract audio or do a quick leveling or something of an audio track, I'll use Audacity sometimes. But I'm a big fan of, uh, I'm a huge fan of of uh of reaper it just it just does all the things i wanted to do v worldwide thank you for the uh the super chat my friend much appreciated uh anytime you um anytime people uh contribute it helps me do these things and buy all the crazy gear that makes this crazy show work <laughs> so i i appreciate the support my friend um audacity yes that's exactly the audacity it's a it's a open source which means it's different people contribute to help building uh, the code for it um, and it, but it's free. It's open source usually means free where it's anyone can grab it and use it. Ableton Live. Yeah, I've used Ableton Live too. Ableton Live is very good. Um, I did use Cakewalk a few times. What was the one I was trying to think? The one that Trent Reznor used to, I can't remember the name of it. Was it Ableton? I don't think so. There was one that Trent Reznor used to use and it was more of a you know, stacking block type of multi-track. It's been a while. Um, so I, I, I tend to find, I tend to find whatever feels right for me. And then I roll with that. Um, uh, let me see. The question here was any Linux video software. Yeah, I believe Reaper is Linux. Reaper will let, oh, video software. You're asking for video. Uh, good question. I don't know. Let me get back to you on that. Uh, Filmora isn't, um, Linux based. It's only Mac and PC cause I'm a PC guy. So I tend to lean on that, but video software, let me see if I can answer that question. I'll leave it in the comments as well. If I can find a, a good Linux based one, um, I wonder if DaVinci runs on Linux. I want to say DaVinci does, but let me, let me, let me confirm that. Uh, Marlon. Hey, Matt, thank you for the, the uh, super chat. Much appreciated, pal. Again, anyone out there um, wanting to dive deeper into the, uh, what kind of effects that are out there, VST plugins and softwares and how to use them. Uh, Marlon at white noise studio is absolutely your guy. He's uh, he's really, he's just got, he's got so much information on his channel. Um, how much audio bit rate does YouTube support? That's a good question. I don't know if there's a maximum. Um, I, they, it's a good question. I, some of the, some of the, I've never had an issue with the bit rate I export at, which is again, you know, most of the time I'm using Filmora, which I think it's limited to MP3 at 320 kbps. It's not super high, but that's all right. You know, it works. It it's, it's decent to the ear. Uh, it's you know anything lower than that, I start getting freaking out, especially with MP3s. It starts jangling the top end. Um, so. Um, usually won't have too much of a problem with audio. Um, uh, but that's a good question with the actual physical limitation of what YouTube will allow. They do, they do have different limitations, um, sometimes for, um, different size creators and in terms of how much of it you can upload and how long you, how much bandwidth you can use up. But I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll look into that. Uh, Marlon says it's not much, uh, like GarageBand on Windows. Apple has nailed it. Yeah, I agree. Trials of Cubase and yeah, loops and effect fruity fruity loops. Yeah, there's one. I've tried fruity loops too. That's not bad either. With the kind of built-in stuff, yeah, that it, right there you can start playing with it. Right, good call, Marlon. Fruity loops. Um, that's a great one too. Um, let me just. I'm handling a couple of questions here. Which bit rate is best while streaming through OBS? Depends. Um, I'm using, like I said today, uh, our our wonderful sponsor of today is uh, Streamyard. So I use. Uh, I'm you know I'm streaming. Um, you know, I'm streaming in, in terms of the, the visual end of it, I'm streaming in 1080p in terms of the audio end of it. I, th it's a little more compressed, um, in terms of audio, com I, like I said, I think most of the stuff you're going to hear, um, that sounds decent as an MP3 format is probably somewhere in the, 
you know, uh, the, t the two standards, first of all, are 44.1 and 48K, 44.1 being like the CD standard, 48K being the more rounded universal standard. Um, either one of those works. And then for bitrate, you know, anything, I think three, if you're going to be doing MP3, anything 320 or higher will probably get the job done. MP3 is a more universally accepted, um, you know, wave is the, the basic stuff we work with, but a lot of times being able to shoot files across quickly, MP3 is a little quicker. Um, just depends on, I, I listen, I, um, I try to really listen to, um, I try to listen to the thing really there's really good monitors and I'm always listening for compression and crackle. What happens is, is when you start compressing audio too much, the, the top end is the first thing you hear. You ever hear like a warble? You ever listen to that MP3 and it got like, it's got like a little warble to it. Like it sounds jangly up top. That usually is a really low bit rate or it's compressed too hard from literally bit rate compression of it. Um, so I don't like it getting too squashed when I start hearing stuff that's like under 192 and below. It's like, ugh, it sounds horrible to me. What's the most pro video you've ever made? Good question. You tell me. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think they're all pro. I tried my best every time to make a solid video. Um, the last one I made was I put a lot of time in. I, I spent three days on that edit just trying to really pull it together and make it sound sound and look good. Um, the one I'm working on right now is pretty impressive. It's, I'm really working on the audioscape and, and showing how to film like real um, cinematic using a real simple setup, single light, single camera. Um, the one I'm doing now, I shot with, uh, one of these, which is what I'm, what you're looking through right now is this is a, um, that's a Sony a 6,400. Well, yeah, here it is. Sony a 6,400 with a Sigma 16 millimeter 1.4 lens. Um, I think they look great. They're good for live streaming. They're good for filming. They're not super expensive. The bodies themselves are under a thousand dollars. I say not that expensive. Some stuff is so expensive nowadays that I have three of them. I have, I actually have one in my hand. There's one that's filming me now. There's, I've got another one right there with the same lens on it. And then I've got this one right here that, <laughs> that's in my hand. That's how much I like this camera and this lens combination. Um, because I think, yeah, I think I spend about 11 or $1,200 for the lens and the camera together. And they just, they work really great. I just love them. So, um, so I, the, the one I'm working on was showing how to take that camera, um, the video I'm working on right now, and I'm doing sort of like a real cinematic look and then doing the soundscape for it because I, I think I need to show people more how to actually set up the camera and get the shot. And the other stuff, I'm kind of glancing over quickly because I covered it in my last video. So I'll, I guess my next one is my, my next video. Well, that's the one I always work on the most is the next one. <laughs> that's the one that has the most work. I'm watching a lot of times your video on how to uh, cr crush a Coca-Cola can. Yeah, telekinetic. Yeah, I, that was a fun one. That was one I did right at my dining room table where I did like use the force. And it was a combination of, it was me reaching out and I, the can was on the table. And as I crushed my hand, the, the can crushed in on itself. It looked like I was using the, like my telekinetic or the, using the force, like I was in Star Wars, uh, my Jedi powers. And it was just a couple of techniques of stop motion animation and split screening using masks to create um, a really cool effect. It looked pretty realistic. Uh, the sound on that, I think I had, you know, probably, I was probably 12 layers into the audio on that too. That's another great example of I, where I used audio to create this huge can crush effect um, with dramatic music and building up. And it was a lot of, uh, the audio helped sell that. If I didn't have the audio in there, it would have just looked like a can collapsed on itself. And not quite, um, and not quite, it's not, it's not so much the video as much as the audio helping it out. Uh, you assume that when I said I did not know that it meant someone else did not know. I'm glad to hear that you you already knew. You never know with me. I try to find people around here that are smarter than me. Um, like I said, Marlon from White Noise Studio, great resource for this kind of thing. So um, um, that's uh, that's it's nice to have people around in the in the community that are really helpful like that. And I'll get Marlon on here one of these days. We'll, we'll do a live stream and we'll talk about some of the cool VST plugins. Um, I'm trying to get people comfortable with a digital audio workstation. I think a lot of us in this community are comfortable with like Filmora or Movavi, um, you know, and those those video editing software. Some people use DaVinci, but a lot of us are here in my community are using um, Filmora and Movavi and things like that. So uh, some of them are using Camtasia, um, but that, there's not extensive um, uh, audio, digital audio workstations involved. That's why I'm trying to show Reaper. I think it's the right the right choice in there. Um, you don't know if you'd spend money on a drone or a pro camera, pro camera. And let me tell you why. Um, in the, if you're in the United States, especially, but in other countries too, um, you have to have a license to fly a drone and use that footage on your, 
um, if you're going to use that footage on your channel and your channel is monetized. So you can, I mean, you can get in big trouble. You can get like the FAA in the United States will come after you if they found that you are putting up drone footage in anywhere. And it can get even worse if you're anything like over a state park. <clears throat> There's real tricky things you have to watch out for. So I think an everyday camera, pro camera, get a decent camera. One, you can use it for live streaming. On the obvious way, you can use it to actually film. Um, invest in one decent camera with some decent glass. And when I say glass, the lens that you put on it. Um, is the best investment I think that you can make. Start there. You don't need to have it. You know, every one of us has a pretty decent camera, usually right inside of our mobile device that you can start filming today. I'll probably do a video on showing you how to use your mobile device's camera um, to make some really cool footage. But I think the first investment, drones are fun, but unless you're going to be doing like an all drone channel and you're going to get the license and do all that stuff, I honestly think a, a start with a camera, really learn camera basics and learning how to use your camera and that that will pay dividends. Um, Pat, uh, Pat Kapowicz, Realtor, um, thank you very much for the $25 suit, man, my friend. Uh, it's the Super Chat. Super Chat? Super? What am I saying? Super Chat. Pat, um, yeah, I mean, we got to talk about your channel. I got to head on over there. He's uh, Pat is uh, uh, one of the, the channels I've coached. We've been working, trying to get him up and running. I'm dying to see what you do next, my friend. I appreciate the Super Chat. It helps me do what I do. Um, using HitFilm Express, another great one. I don't know that HitFilm... Um, Tejas, I don't know if they have much of a audio section in there. I think they do have something, but it's... Um, it, it, it's, it's still limited as well. So yeah, knowing I, 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 you'll be hard pressed. There are some, even like Adobe audition, um, you have to, you know, it's like, man, everything with Adobe, you have to pay for the extra layers. Um, and that integrates well, but I don't know that I love it as much. I've, you know, I've played around with audition. It's not quite as extensive as a full dedicated digital audio workstation. It's good. It's very good, but there's always something I run into with trying to make things, um, um, to make them really try to pop. I, I'm so used to being in a digital audio workstation. That I love being in that space. I love having a board in front of me. I love when um, I love when I have this look, right? I'm so used to having my ways and all my faders and all of that, right? Because I want I want it to feel like like I'm you know at a at a at a big desk. I'm so used to um, I'm so used to being um, um, you know, at a at a big mixing console with all the faders that I feel like I'm back there again. <laughs> works for me. You have a uh, rec video that I want to edit and load that's epic. Awesome. I, I hope it works out well for you. Um, a quick question here. How do I get the community button? Because I have the discussions tab. Yeah, that comes with, um, they've changed the, it, it comes when you hit a certain mark. It. I didn't get it till, man, a community tab. I think when I got it, it was like 10,000 subscribers. But I think they've now changed it to 1,000. So it's basically, I think once you hit, and I, I can't remember if it's a thousand subscribers and you have to be monetized, but I don't think so. I think it's if you hit a thousand subscribers, you can look on Google support and they'll give you the exact requirements because they've moved it. They've moved the bar recently. Um, and once you hit that threshold of, of a certain size, they switch it from discussion to a community tab. Um, all right, listen, I think I've covered a lot today. I hope this was helpful to you guys. Um, if there's any questions you have that I did not hit today, please put them down in the comments and I will catch them on the replay. Make sure you check out the links in the description, not only to Reaper so you can download Reaper and start using it. I've got a great video in there that brings you to all the links and explains how to install it and how to get free VST plugins and start using Reaper today. Really, really fantastic. But check out the links for our sponsors today, um, StreamYard, the great company that allows me to make these streams that I make right here on this channel. I'm smacking into my mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, and also check out the uh, check out Spreadshop if you're looking to get merch of your own that might help you uh, generate a little bit of revenue on your channel, whether you're monetized or not. And I, uh, I just want to say thanks again. Thanks to all the mods who have been in here. And I will catch you. Uh, I'll catch you next time. Have a great day, everybody. Peace.